Hello and welcome to another episode of the Startup Operator Roundup. I'm Roshan Karepa and I'm Gunjan Saha and together we break down the biggest headlines from India's growing startup ecosystem. If this is the first time you're tuning into the channel then please consider subscribing to it. We regularly post updates from the startup ecosystem and if you're a returning visitor please like this video, review it on your favorite podcast platform and send us your thoughts through the comments below on what other things we can try out in the roundup. For the 131st edition, we'll be talking Karnataka's new sector-based strategy to take up the startup ecosystem beyond Bangalore. We'll be evaluating the performance of India's digital currency, the e-rupee. It's they're almost coming up of one year of circulation. Google has launched a new initiative called the DigiCoverage. This is to tackle online financial frauds. Then BIS recently approved India's first ever indigenously developed charging connector standard. And well, uh, apart from this, also a huge congratulations to the Perfuse team. Uh, they had 154 crore rupees ESOPs buyback, and that created 62 million ads. Wow! So I mean, um, uh, the number doesn't add up, but then <laughs> I suppose you know we we should get some party invites yeah, yeah, from yeah. the Perfuse folks, right? <laughs> so stay tuned as we break down these headlines for you. All right, so um. you know traffic problems and bangalore they often go hand in hand right and many people say that you know one of the reasons why this infrastructural collapse has sort of happened is because of the startup boom in the city and that caused a lot of people to migrate in right well the government has definitely taken notice of this fact so they want to expand the state's startup capital just beyond bangalore and turn cities like mangalore belgaum and mysore into other startup hubs The Karnataka government has also launched initiatives like Beyond Bangalore program which promotes emerging technology clusters in different regions of the state and uh, there are also budgets allocated for it uh, they've introduced incentives for startups they've allocated funds for incubation center and uh, it's a very interesting name for it called the Innovers hmm. so Innovers is aimed to provide support and resources for startups You know, we have been talking about that the next phase of growth for India is going to come from Bharat, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we are seeing the kind. I mean, Shark Tank, of course, has kind of highlighted the amount of innovation that goes on into tier two, tier three places. And on top of that, we have had some amazing founders from places like Madurai, from Coimbatore, and other tier two or let's say non-metro cities, right? Um, so, what do you think? What is the signal now? Now, the government is also trying to promote that. Yeah, see, in my time, I have seen Bangalore go from a pensioners' paradise to India's Silicon Valley, right? Uh, you can all trace it back to maybe the '80s or late '80s when uh, Texas Instruments uh, first set up their uh, uh, office here, and then, of course, you know, you had the likes of Infi, TCS, Wipro. uh sort of uh, set up the base here as well right you know i mean the, the city has grown the economy has grown and there's been a lot of development uh, on that front which uh, has made a lot of people uh, uh very rich for sure uh, right the real estate prices are you know uh, almost unaffordable right now uh, still better than bombay i should say right <laughs> but uh, it has come at a cost right obviously i mean it's it's a bit of a joke right now in terms of the traffic and what not but i still remember a time and not too long ago i mean i'm talking about even 10 to 15 years ago when it was a little better right the sadly the roads and the infrastructure have not improved at all right and you have 35000 new cars getting into the city every day uh, how is the city going to handle this uh, and this is a case for every city that is growing in india right so this concept of sister cities satellite towns so on and so forth have you know people have been contemplating it for a while now but policy makers should really consider that and push for it you know for starters i would say bangalore to mysore you know if there is some kind of high speed rail that enables that 100 km 120 km commute in about half an hour to 40 minutes mm -hmm. i think a lot of people rather than living in whitefield or belandur or wherever else would uh, perhaps consider mysore which is a lot nicer right i mean it reminds me of um, you know bangalore of the 80s actually very quiet roads uh, spacious green all of those things right uh, so i think the development definitely has to spread out uh, it's good that the government is thinking of that and you know offering some incentives rather than you know you know whatever innovation programs and those kind of things i would say just improve the infrastructure on the outside mm -hmm. uh right and and things could happen infosys in fact i mean set up their uh, learning and development center in mysore way back when i think maybe like uh, i should say 15 years back or something right and and that has helped the ecosystem grow there a little bit 
uh, I would say, I mean, if a few more people uh, consider that, right? I mean, it's only a matter of time, right? I mean, everything has an inflection point. From an India perspective, I think 100% we need to sort of look beyond the metros, right? And it's already happening. Uh, I would say COVID was the second flattening of the world, world right? So place and uh, distance is no longer uh, a constraint these days, now with remote and soon virtualization and so on, right? So yeah, uh, let's hope that the, you know, the development is kind of distributed, right? And uh, that I can make it to office in less than 20 minutes or so. <laughs> Okay, I don't know about uh, reaching office, but for sure I'd like to get home sooner and open a bottle and enjoy the Bangalore weather. Priorities. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so in a fortnight, you know, we'll be completing a year since RBI introduced the e-rupee, the mm. CBDC. Uh, the e-rupee, you know, had three objectives. That was to drive financial inclusion, digitization of the economy and simplification of cross-border trade settlement. But another way of looking at the EUP is that it was meant to reduce dependency on the US dollar. It was to kill the threat of cryptocurrencies and also manage monetary policies in a cashless currency, right? Now, um, it had aimed to reach 1 million daily transactions by December 2023. But right now, we are two months into the deadline and we haven't even achieved 2% of the target. Wow. Do you think the RBI had kind of really glorified the potential of uh, e-rupee and kind of hope that it would be a success similar to UPI or or what? See, I, I, I'm not saying that it was hastily put together, but I think the use cases really have to emerge, right? Because it's not apparent to me, fairly tech savvy, uh, right? I mean, at least tech savvy enough to use UPI and whatnot, which is, you know, plenty of Indians, uh, right? But the use cases are not strong enough, you know. I mean, I saw a few emails from uh, HDFC, Axis Bank, uh, I think, you know, asking to, you know, uh, put, I don't even know, actually, you know, I don't even know what the use case is specifically, hmm. right? Uh, and so, I mean, which is why you're seeing the very poor adoption, right? I mean, see, all of these things just make UPI so much more uh, phenomenal, right? Because... Finding, and we, and we spoke about this uh, with Vimal of Jespe, who was on the podcast last week as well. Um, fantastic episode. You guys should definitely check it out whenever it's out. Um, right? That population scale problems, you have to solve something like an integral need. You're not mm -hmm. going to get immediate adoption just because you launch something. Right? There are plenty of government schemes and whatnot that people don't even know about or care, care for. Right? So, I mean, I hope that the RBI uses data from whatever they've seen over the last year and uh, tries to like, you know, uh, fix some of this stuff and mm. make some emergent use cases. Cross-border exchange is one thing where I definitely feel that uh, there could be value in this, right? But for you or me, um, at this point of time, I don't know. I don't see immediate value as such. Mm. No, I, I downloaded the HDFC um, ERP app. It's a separate app for it. And you sign up, you give your bank data, and it's kind of like an ATM, mm. right? Where uh, the digital currency gets deposited in your wallet and you can use that on your day-to-day -day okay. transactions. But even though I had the app installed on my phone, I did not, given that UPI is already there, right? In the store where I'm purchasing something or anywhere yeah, else, right? Exactly. It's just oh, so much more wallets, convenient. Right? Yeah. Oh, you have wallets. I mean, I didn't see this as an integration on Swiggy or Uber or anywhere else, hmm. right? I mean... Yeah, th there is definitely a use case in the sense that it could be a, a different kind of wallet. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't really taken off. Mm. But what do you think of the things which EUP was supposed to solve for it? Right? Primarily, reducing the dependency on US dollar and tackling crypto. Now, well, I think crypto is pretty much out of the picture now. But uh, what about the whole dependency on the US dollar? See, dependency on uh, US dollar, I mean, it's uh, it's like a pipe dream, right? I mean, it's going to happen. It's not going to be one thing that uh, kind of switches it, uh, right? I mean, you saw last year, for example, with the whole Vostro Nostro accounts, uh, mm -hmm. we started, uh, you know, uh, trading uh, with Russia in rupees uh, and buying oil uh, with that, right? And similarly, we had a similar setup with the, the Middle East as well, uh, right? And our neighbors in, let's say, Sri Lanka uh, and Nepal, now, a lot of things are going to come together to sort of reduce our dependency on the US dollar, not particularly anything like this, uh, right? So, so we'll have to wait and watch, I suppose. Right, yeah. Well, but I mean, if other digital currencies which are launched by other countries are of any examples, like uh, Sweden's e-krona, 
and uh, China's digital one. Even these currencies have not really, you know, taken off. So again, you kind of makes you go back to the drawing board and think, what's the entire utility? Next, uh, Google India has launched a program called the Digi Coverage to protect people from online financial frauds. It is an early threat detection and warning system that identifies and studies emerging financial fraud patterns. They have partnered with the FinTech Association for Consumer Empowerment or FACE to combat predatory digital lending apps, especially on the Play Store in India. Now on YouTube recently, I came across a new BBC documentary, right? It was titled, this was the biggest scam in India. Of course, I mean, made me want to click, right? And of course. You won't believe, and this this scam was about lending apps that came out. Mm -hmm. They used to offer short-term credit of like, let's say, 10, 15 days. Now, I don't know, through some bug or something, they used to retrieve all data from people's personal devices and use that data to blackmail, to uh, give live threats to these mm -hmm. people. As a result, many people committed suicide even. So it was a huge, huge problem. And yeah, that documentary kind of introduced me uh, to this uh, idea that hey, something like this is happening. And now Google has come up with coverage. And there have been a lot of apps which have been blocked from the Google store, uh, Play Store as well, like Pocket Cash, White Cash, Golden Cash, <laughs> OK Rupee. Um, but yeah, I mean, what do you, what do you think of this? I mean, it's certainly helpful, right? I mean, uh, Google, Apple, Amazon, the ecosystem players have to definitely take uh, safety, security very, very seriously. Uh, I would say, right now, you know, with the uh, with the UPI adoption and with the consumer internet catching up and so on, right? I mean, scamsters will find plenty of ways to uh, you know uh, commit fraud and scams, right? I mean, for sure, there are hundreds of different ways. I mean, just last week I was uh, hearing of uh, somebody's. Uh, money being taken out of their uh, savings account, which is unreal, mm -hmm. right? I mean, savings you generally think that okay, I mean, it's kind of safe. But um, yeah, uh, the other authentication, everything was uh, proper and uh, uh, their money was uh, debited, right, without their knowledge. And, you know, it's happened to a friend's friend. And I can tell you that uh, the redressal from banks is is very, very poor, right? They're next to useless when it comes to helping you with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I can tell you two years back, I transferred about 30K to the wrong person. I might, must have written maybe 10, 12 emails, uh, even up to the head CEO of the bank. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't got that 30K back, right? So I just gave up after a while. So uh, folks, I mean, if you're listening, go to the Aadhaar website and lock your biometrics. It's very, very important uh, just so that you're safe and you know your data is not abused. Um, yeah, so it's good. I mean, it's very good that um, Google is doing something at least, right? <laughs> so... All right. Um, <clears throat> I hope people, I hope Googlers don't uh, listen to this podcast, right? I mean, we've, we've dunked down Google so many times <laughs> that, yeah. But that's only because we have such high expectations. Good save. <laughs> okay, so last week, India has achieved another significant milestone. This is in the EV space. Uh, the sector has developed the world's first combined charging connector standard for both AC and DC charging in light electric vehicles. The new charging connector standards bring benefits to all stakeholders of the ecosystem, including vehicle owners, manufacturers, and charging point operators, and also gives OEMs more flexibility yeah. uh, to choose from different standards and protocols uh, rather than relying solely on international ones. This is also expected to reduce costs for, of uh, charging and also uh, boost the setting of charging infrastructure. It simplifies the charging process for customers as they no longer need to carry their chargers, they can just use say, the same connector for both AC and DC charging at any service station or service point. The development had collaborative effort involving organizations like Niti Aayog, Department of Science and Technology, ARI, EV manufacturers, and the Bureau of Indian Standards. Now, I think this addresses a really key market gap, right? Mm. So I have this uh, friend uh, who lives like a bit further away from Hennur. He recently bought an Aether. Uh, every time he comes to visit me in JP Nagar, he k or kind of always thinks twice, okay, will I have enough battery to go back home? Must like you a lot if he's traveling from Henno to JP Nagar. Hey, what can I say? Right? <laughs> With the Bangalore traffic and whatnot. <laughs> but yeah, in all seriousness, right? I, I think, you know, charging stations have to come up. The infrastructure has to evolve for EV adoption to pick up. Um, uh, we've definitely made giant strides. But the cost of innovation at this point of time, right, is still high. Uh, I would say once the ecosystem matures, uh, once we have standards evolve, 
the cost of the innovation will be a lot cheaper. And here I'm not just talking about the kind of innovation where we just import stuff from China. China is, by the way, the largest in EV right now in the mm. world, right? People may not realize, but about 10 years back, this whole IoT craze was uh, very, very tangible, yeah. right? I mean, everyone wanted to develop and so on. But the standards did not evolve sufficiently, you know. Uh, and in that case, it's very, very difficult, right? I mean, as a startup, uh, how many different integrations will you build, right? Mm. Uh, it's it's very, very difficult, right? I mean, uh, not everyone can be Apple and say that new phone doesn't fit the old, <laughs> you know, charging cable, right? So common standards will certainly help people, uh, you know, uh, reduce all of the development burden of building for different uh, uh, different style, different other protocols and whatnot, right? I mean, and that's how a lot of the mainstream technology works, right? Whether it is, uh, you know, audio, video, um, internet, uh, blockchain, what have you, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the common set of protocols so people can think of everything else uh, and build at the application level, right? So they don't have to build uh, for all of the other things. So yeah, I really hope that with this, the stack matures and uh, you know we'll see people working on very specific, very finite uh, problems within EV. Right. Now, I would liken this more to like the protocols, the standard protocols that were set for the internet. Mm. I mean, think about it. What if there was there were multiple internets? Internets, <laughs> right? Uh, but because of the standardization, I mean, internet definitely because the st without the standardization, the internet would not be the thing we know of it as today. Coming back to the news, Perfuse raised $229 million in Series D funding from Kedara Capital. This was in September of 2023. And a week back, they announced that they are buying back shares worth 154 crore rupees from 135 employees. These include both current and ex-employees. Mm -hmm. There would be a total of 62 millionaires. Wow. Right? And the, the math doesn't add up, right? I mean, 62 millionaires, let's say, you know, 8 crores for a millionaire, that's a mm. give or take about 500 crores, right? And the mm. the ease of buyback is for 154 crores. Now, unless the <laughs> unless the journalist uh, thought that it was rupee millionaires, in which case it's like 10 lakh, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, but yeah, Did the you math- Get down to the source of this, article, this news. The math doesn't add up, but uh, you know, uh, fantastic stuff. Yeah, sorry, finish <laughs> what you were saying. No, uh, just something which I really like that among the 135 total beneficiaries of this ESOP buyback, 80 of them are women, mm. right? I think uh, this is a very uh, big number and very commendable. Awesome. Yeah, see, ESOP buybacks are uh, always welcome, right? Because ESOPs, uh, again, it just feels like uh, they're stuck in your uh, account forever and uh, nothing really happens of it. Um, so these kind of things are for sure uh, helpful. Uh, reinforces a lot more confidence in uh, working for startups. Uh, 2021 was the uh, the year for ESOP, ESOP buybacks, ESOP, right? Yeah. I mean, literally every company that was uh, doing around that time announced that. So we haven't had one for a long time, I would say, uh, right? So so it's it's very nice to hear of this. Hmm. Uh, speaking of uh, Joylita, who's a friend of mine, is building a fantastic uh, uh, startup on this, right? I mean, how do you monetize your ESOPs? It's called infinite.club. Infinite is spelled with a Y. So that's I-N-F-I-N-Y-T-E, I think, or we'll perhaps I mean, link it on the description. Uh, do check it out. I mean, it seems uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, sign up for early release of their app and whatnot. So yeah, go joy. <laughs> <laughs> so Roshan, uh, we've come across some really interesting tweets on Twitter. And I thought, you know, this is a good platform to kind of discuss that as well. Uh, Mohit Kumar, who is the co-founder and CEO of Ultra Human, he posted two graphs which shows the average selling price of smartwatches in India versus China. Now, what's interesting here to see is that, yes, the cost of a smartwatch has gone down in both the countries, but its smartwatches are much more cheaper and reliable in India as compared to that of China. Mm. So what do you think is happening here? Is it, is it the boat effect? I don't know. I mean, we certainly have uh, indigenous brands emerge, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, that could be that, right? I mean, uh, that uh, these folks are uh, selling it at a, a lesser price uh, in India than elsewhere. I mean, I'm not totally surprised, right? I mean, we have the cheapest internet uh, anywhere in the world. Mm. We have the cheapest quality of uh, services uh, anywhere in the world. 
Mm. Uh, so so yeah, I mean, why not smart watches? Mm. So I, I don't know what that specific inflection point was, though. I mean, that's an interesting question. If you guys know, I mean, you should uh, perhaps look at the graph and make sense of it, right? Yeah. Um, was it some kind of a policy change? Uh, or, you know, was it some massive investment from one of the bigger uh, organizations? I don't know. So, yeah, mm -hmm. let us know in the comments. Right. Uh, another tweet which we came across was this video snippet of an interview with Jensen, who is the CEO of um, NVIDIA. Mm. This is in a podcast with Ben Gilbert. And uh, in the clip, Ben asked that if he could do the entire startup journey all over again, what, it, what would it be like? To which uh, Jensen answers this. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I know. And the reason for that is really quite simple. Ignoring the company that we would start. First of all, I'm not exactly sure. The reason why I wouldn't do it, and it goes back to why it's so hard, is building a company and building a video turned out to have been a million times harder than I expected it to be. Any of us expected it to be. And at that time, if we realized the pain and suffering and just how vulnerable you, you're going to feel um, and the challenges that you're going to endure, uh, the embarrassment and the shame and, you know, the list of all the things that, that go wrong, I don't think anybody would start a company. Nobody in their right mind would do it. That's a very <laughs> counterintuitive take, don't you think? And makes it all the more incredible that uh, this is a person who's built a $1 trillion company, right? Uh, NVIDIA market cap was $1.04 trillion last time when I checked, uh, right? And uh, Jensen himself is worth about $37 or $38 billion. Now, this person saying that, you know, he wouldn't start up, uh, it shows you how hard founder life is, right? Irrespective of what kind of company it is and, you know, at what stage or what scale you are at. Uh, it's just a hard life, really, really hard life. I mean, people say that there should be more entrepreneurs and I completely empathize. But the question also is like, you know, why do so many yeah. people put themselves through all of this shit, right? Uh, I feel that it's a it's a human quirk. I mean, it's a, it's a bug of uh, human nature that we have some of these folks who kind of put themselves through all of this stuff, have the agency, have the perseverance, have the ingenuity and uh, just simply the ability to absorb so much of pressure and shocks uh, and create something wonderful, right? So yeah, kudos to all the entrepreneurs out there. Thank you for founding companies and uh, yeah, giving us jobs also. <laughs> and also giving us something to talk about. Yeah, of course. <laughs> what would we talk about otherwise? <laughs> Bye, <Jus. laughs> <laughs> All right, now before we move on to the talk of the town section, here are some of the notable fundraisers we had last week. Uh, manufacturing Marketplace Zetwork has raised 967 crores or $118 million from Evni Growth Capital and Footpath Ventures. Space tech startup Agnikool Cosmos raised $26.7 million from Celesta Capital, Rocketship VC, Artha Venture Fund, Mayfield India, Pi Ventures and Speciale Invest. Showroom B2B raised $6.5 million from Jungle Ventures, Axion Venture Lab, Season Capital and others. And logistics startup Fred Tiger raised $18 million from Tata Motors for at almost a 27% stake. Now what we're seeing is that venture capital inflow in the third week of October has steadily risen, mm -hmm. but I still would not be saying that this would continue. Um, but it's yeah, good to see that large check size. We have a three digit check size as well. Yeah. So it's, there can be some optimism. Yeah. No, uh, do check out uh, uh, the Zetwork episode with Amrit Acharya. Uh, we, I think, recorded that a couple of years back. Yeah. I went back to that, I mean, uh, maybe a a few weeks back when I was doing some research on B2B marketplaces and realized that, you know, Amrit, uh, whatever he was saying, right, whether in terms of manufacturing or so on, uh, is so relevant, right? I mean, even uh, after that time, uh, I think Zetwork is a wonderful business, right? B2B marketplace uh, with financing, with software, all of that stuff, uh, right? So do check it out. And certainly not an easy business to run, uh, hmm. right? I mean, We've seen uh, B2B marketplaces uh, struggle, right? Uh, I can think of Udan, for example. So, yeah, certainly a tough business for sure, right? And uh, uh, they became a unicorn in two years, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, so, again, this was 2021. So, <laughs> you know, Do a you lot of people of became uh, unicorns uh, very, very quickly. I think Bharat Pay before that was the record holder, I think. Maybe three or four years, I suppose. The startup that took the least amount of time to become a unicorn is Mensa Brands. I think they took close to six months. Oh. to reach a $1 billion valuation. Yeah. 
by the way i've been trying to have anant uh, on the podcast as well i mean he's taking a bit of break from podcast so uh, hopefully we have him on the show sometime um, right so so yeah interesting for sure and good to see tata motors uh, getting in the action right yeah. i mean yeah hell yeah <laughs> all right so last week uh, there was a viral video which shows a girl posing as a zomato delivery executive in indore riding a motorcycle wearing zomato's uniform Rajan, what do you think of that video? Hey, I mean, uh, interesting for sure, right? I mean, reminds me of the Red Bull uh, girls, <laughs> right? I mean, at uh, college fests and whatnot, yeah. right? Um, I, I don't know if Zomato, I, I don't know if some marketing manager of Zomato thought of this, but uh, hey, kudos. Certainly well, no, got attention is, um, for sure. We definitely got attention, especially if you've seen the video, <laughs> the guy who just comes <laughs> on the bike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, no, but Dipinder, uh, who's the founder and CEO of Zomato, he took to Twitter and he has denied any involvement or association with the video and says it was not a marketing stunt by the company dipinder also says that zomato does not support helmetless biking and that the company does not have an indoor marketing head as claimed by the video's creator all right folks so that is it for the 131st edition of the startup operators weekly roundup we hope you enjoyed the content uh, please do keep sending us your suggestions on what are the various new things we can try out i know a lot of you have been asking for us to curate the recommended reading list the recommended listening list which speakers on our podcast have uh, re- recommended um, so yeah we'll be uh, publishing that list soon Uh once again if this is the first time you t- tuned into the channel please consider subscribing uh then you will be able to get regular updates from our end and if you're a returning visitor do like this video so that the algorithm refers more such content to you uh until then yes if you want updates to be delivered straight into your whatsapp inbox click on the whatsapp link and of course follow us on social media all right so we'll be back again with more exciting updates next week stay tuned happy dashara happy navratri and have a re- great rest of the week Happy Dashara guys and see you soon. <laughs>